I am Dan Riaz. We're talking about customer segmentation for startups. Uh, this is primarily a 101 talk. It's not like a 301 or 401 where we're going to talk about slicing and dicing really granularly. I imagine most of you at this point do not have too much data. So we're really going to talk about the initial queries and segmentations you should run um, to optimize for growth with really small budgets, right, and to make the most impact. Uh, so quickly about me before we get started, I spent nine years in Silicon Valley, various marketing roles for consumer tech companies, um, everything from product marketing to performance marketing, and most recently growth. Last couple of rodeos uh, were split between Zynga and Lyft. Uh, at Zynga, I was one of the first mobile marketing hires, uh, managed their acquisition spend across their entire portfolio of games on Android and iOS. At Lyft, I was the fourth hire on the growth team. Uh, so came in pretty early when we were in four markets. Helped them scale to 65 markets in one year. So that was uh, one crazy fucking ride. Unintended, definitely intended. Um, and now I'm a distribution hacker at 500 startups. Um, so the agenda, again, it's primarily one-to-one. -one. We're really going to be looking for uh, power law distributions, 80-20s, right, to see if we can find power users, right, to really target. Um, and grow. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about like what customer segmentation is uh, from an academic standpoint, um, and then what types of data you should be collecting, right? Everything from behavioral data to demographic data, right? We'll talk a little bit about psychographic data. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into all that stuff, but I really want to focus on behavioral data. Uh, then I want to talk about providing these different data types, right? To actually get like a concrete segment, a concrete view of your users. Um, we'll look at Lyft and kind of see uh, how we did that there. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Zynga as well, um, kind of a case study from Premium Gaming. Um, so a little bit of this talk is actually kind of like reopening old wounds, kind of shows you how crazy the valley is because like, I generated a lot of learnings from working at both of those companies. So I want to tell you guys about how segmentation um, can work right across different verticals and across different uh, businesses. So we'll look at Premium Gaming as well because it's highly segmented and there's some pitfalls there. right? And I want you guys to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about optimizing spend, right? We're trying to figure out where your power users are coming from and how to go after them. Uh, and then uh, we'll close up with some recommended tools. So what is it and why should you care? So this is a definition from, oh, we're one slide behind. There we go. Uh, so this is a definition from salesforce.com. Uh, customer segmentation is the practice of dividing a customer base into groups of individuals that are similar in specific ways relevant to marketing such as age, gender, interest, and spending habits. So all Salesforce.com is really saying is, all this is is dividing your user base to, but use, uh, dividing your user base by different data points, um, age, gender, interest, and spending habits, so demographic data and behavioral data for marketing purposes, right? Using these do those data points uh, to help grow your company, right? And to help market to your customers, right? And so there's a lot more than just age and gender and spending. There's a lot of different types of data that you can actually um, divide your users by. So uh, the primary source that we're going to look at is behavioral data. So we'll talk about uh, you know your funnel, right, and engagement with your funnel, right, from a product standpoint. Uh, we'll also talk about geographic data. For some of you, you might see really strong pockets of users uh, in different zip codes or different cities. Uh, we'll talk about uh, demographic data, of course, age and gender. Uh, we'll also talk about psychographic data. This matters, so why are they using it? You'll actually see some of your power users and your non-power users, they'll use it differently. Like, even if you only have one offering, they might still use your product differently. Uh, and then lastly, we'll close up an acquisition source, right? So, you know, where are these people coming from? Okay, so why should you care? Because this is you right now, right? I haven't even looked at all of your funnels, but I definitely know that a lot of this, or a lot of you guys, right, probably have this problem where you're burning some money and you don't know it. Um, and that's because you're probably not discriminating um, across your user base as well as you should be. Uh, so not all of your users are equal. I know you've heard that now multiple times from multiple people, so, and I'm, but I'm happy to like kind of belabor that point further, um, that there's definitely differences in your user quality. Um, and you should try to find out you know, those differences as soon as possible so you can use them. You can optimize them for growth purposes. So again, the first type of data that I want to kind of go over is behavioral data, right? And this is data that leverages your funnel. This is the most important source. So your marketing analytics that Andy talked about yesterday, 
that's the most important source of data that we're going to leverage here. And I mean, if you look at this funnel, it's simply just an R funnel, right? So you guys already know what that is. Um, but I'm just going to quickly go over it, just for the point of circular learning and just to kind of hit you over the head with it. Um, you guys already know like acquisition, the top of the funnel, right? So driving uh, new users, whether they're signups or visits or installs. Activation, this is key, right? It's your core engagement metric, right? It's actually converting your new users into active users, right? So it's getting the user to actually engage with your product um, and experience that core value proposition, whatever the hell that is, right? And so at Lyft, I was like taking a ride for the first time, right? Once we got them there, we activated them. At Zynga, it could have been playing a level for the first time in a new game. If you're an e-commerce company, it might be making, it might be getting the user to make a purchase for the first time, right? Retention is simply getting those users to repeat that behavior time and time again. Uh, referrals, of course, is just getting uh, your users to invite their friends. And if you haven't monetized them already via the activation metric, then you're just monetizing them. Um, but when you when you segment your users, right, you start running customer segmentation. The most important metric to look at, the first thing you should look at, is that activation metric, right? So I want you guys to actually look at um, engagement with that core action, whatever it is. So you should sort your users by that activation metric, right? So at Lyft, uh, we would want to look at like how many rides are our users taking across our entire user base. If you're an e-commerce company, you want to look at how many purchases your users are making across your entire user base, and look at this that distribution to see if you can identify any trends. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Right, and so this is like a really extreme example, right? Where I have user count on the y-axis, and I have total purchases on the x-axis. And again, um, you know, this is sticking with the e-commerce example, right? Where uh, you know I'm looking for basically patterns uh, based on frequency of usage, right? So total purchases is my core activation metric, right? It's that core metric that I'm looking for to see if I can identify patterns, right? And this example is really extreme. Right, I have two clusters here. Uh, you probably can't see the numbers, but I have a group of users who purchased one to five things, and I have a group of users who purchased 21 to 25 things on the right-hand side here. Right, and so what you want to look at when you see stuff like this is you want to know what's going on here. Right, like you might think that the people are purchasing 21 to 25 things, right, that they actually have a higher LTV, but they they may or they may not. Right, like they might be purchasing really really low quality things. Uh, and purchases, the people purchasing one to five things might be purchasing really high ticket value items, right? So that's really important. <sighs> Excuse me. So <sighs> frequency plus how your users use your product plus why your users use your product leads to customer segmentation. Once you actually build out those segments, you want to identify who these people are, right? Um, like what are they doing? And who are they? But you really want to know who they are. And for that, I turn to Facebook <coughs> Audience Insights. Uh, Facebook has really, really great data on age, gender, location, income, profession, and education. So you can upload any segment of your users, um, leveraging Facebook Audience Insights, and they'll give you all this data. Right? They'll tell you exactly who they are. Um, sorry about this, guys. So when you combine the two, um, you get different segments, right? And so at Lyft, we did look at our ride volume, right? And um, we looked at that across our entire user base, right? And we did notice different patterns. So we saw people use it every single day, right? And um, one segment we saw were commuters, right? So people using it every day. Um, and they were obviously using it to go to work and come back, right? They were generally between 25 and 35 years old, and they skewed slightly female. Right? That's obviously due to Lyft's brand. Um, they were super high income, right? They generated about, or they earned about $100,000 a year. And their one year net LTV was about 250 bucks. Right? Um, and now that, that one year net LTV, that 250, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call that out as aggressively. That's just to kind of show you the value that um, this user segment can have. It's not the actual user value, um, but it's just to show you that how valuable they could be. So that was one user segment. Um, the next user segment that we found were bar hoppers, right? So these are people um, that used Lyft primarily on the weekend. Uh, they were 18 to 35 years old. They skewed slightly female. Um, they generated 
Um, their net LTV was about, and it was less than 100 bucks. Again, that's a hypothetical number. It was not the exact LTV, um, but they were, there were a lot of them. And they used Lyft um, primarily as designated drivers on the weekends, right? And this was the biggest segment, right? So it included everybody from college kids to professionals uh, to young professionals. And again, they skewed slightly female um, because of Lyft's brand, right? Um, next thing I want to talk about was uh, primarily avoiding pitfalls um, and um, not understanding user behavior enough to basically uh, avoid uh, burning money. So we're going to talk about Zynga and going whale hunting. Uh, at Zynga, essentially, freemium gaming is comprised of a really tiny audience that leads to a lot of monetization. Right. So 1% of your audience actually leads to 95% of the monetization. And when you look at that, you get something like this. Right? This is exactly what it is. And so if you don't understand that, and you buy users indiscriminately, you're wasting a lot of money. Right? So this is what I was getting, what I was getting to when I was saying, like, don't burn money, um, don't waste your money. Uh, because uh, if you buy users across the board without understanding that some users are a lot more valuable than other users, then you're going to burn cash. Right? And so what Zynga did, and what a lot of premium gaming companies do, um, is they do spend indiscriminately. Right? They buy users, they buy installs, they buy signups. They don't actually tie cap to monetization. Right? And you want to tie cap to monetization, you want to make sure when you're spending money and when you're looking at your cap, you're actually looking for paying customers. Right? You're not looking for installs, you're not looking for signups. You don't care about that. You actually want a paying customer. Right? Um, and so um, when you do your unit economics, make sure that, uh, again, you're tying your cap to someone who actually engages with your product. Right? They're actually paying for something. So I talked about like, how not to spend your money. Um, and I want to talk about how you should spend your money. Right? And how you can optimize your ad spend for power users. Right? And so <laughs> I have a couple scenarios here right? where I have my first scenario where you actually are making the distinction between, power, or between customers and users. Right? So you're only looking at your CAC and your LTV on a uh, customer level. So you're only looking at people who actually pay for something. Um, and here are the unit economics. Right? And they're actually pretty rosy, but I do want to show you how you can make them even better. Right? So the unit economics here, um, LTV of your average customer is 15 bucks. CAC of your average customer is 10 bucks. Right? These are pretty rosy. Right? So $1,000 in marketing spend would lead to $1,500 in gross revenue, right? which is $500 in profit for you, which isn't bad. It's like, Basically, 50% return on your investment. Pretty sweet. Scenario two, what I want to be even better, right? And this is what I really want to show you as I drill down to scenario two and I kind of go over payback windows and stuff. That if you actually look for power users, right, um, you can find that your LTV of your power customers is a lot more. So this, again, this is hypothetical, right? I um, this isn't like exact data, but this is very very common. So LTV of your power customers could be 50 bucks two to three acts of your average customer. I've seen that time and time again, especially when it comes down to e-commerce. Your cap of your power customer, I'm throwing it here as like $50, $15. Um, this is just, again, a hypothetical number. It could be higher, it could be lower than your, your cap of your average customer. But I just kind of want to show that to you. right? So $1,000 in marketing leads to 3300 in gross revenue. Right? And that's basically $2,300 in profit, to like a 230% ROI. So you just quadrupled your ROI. right? Um, Next, I want to talk about payback windows, right? So you saw that scenario where if you actually found a power segment, uh, those users are a lot more profitable. Um, but, and you, but you might be thinking that that first scenario wasn't that bad, right? You might be thinking, well, actually, scenario one, Dan, where like, I was generating 50% in profit, right? Um, wasn't that bad for me, right? I actually generated a good amount of profit there, so that was pretty sweet, right? But I do want to go over payback windows because power customers generally have a lot shorter payback windows. Right? So your power customers generally have, um, in this example, I have your power customers have like a three month payback window. Your average customer could have like a six or nine month payback window. Right? Um, and so if you have shorter payback windows, um, it's a lot easier for like any growth marketer to come in and spend a lot more aggressively. The longer the payback window is, um, the less you can spend up front, because it takes a lot longer to earn that money back. Right? So when you identify power customers, uh, you want to look at their payback window. Right? That's really, really important. So don't take your unit economics at like basically face value. Drill back down into the actual payback window and see how long it'll take you to earn that money back, because that's important. And it'll help you grow your business faster by investing a lot more upfront. Okay. 
Last thing I want to talk about is attribution. So I'm not going to go in and geek out on like all these different um, tools because I think like Andy and maybe a couple people talking tomorrow will, will go over that. Um, but you do want to know where these people are coming from, right? Uh, and so uh, tools to use, everything from Mixpanel, Google Analytics branch, really depends you know, whether you're primarily web or mobile. Branch is primarily mobile. Uh, Mixpanel and Google, you can use for web or mobile attribution. Uh, what these guys will allow you to do is basically figure out which channels are performing better, which channels are performing worse, and they'll allow you to double down, right? I mean, you can double down on channels, and you can also tag creative, right? You can tag campaigns, you can tag targeting, you can tag, you can tag creative, and you'll be able to double down on, ad, on, on ads and messaging, right? So it'll allow you to bring in um, higher quality users from like specific channels and uh, specific campaigns. All right, so I just want to sum up here. Um, and I just kind of quickly talk about everything I went over there. Um, so you want to segment your users by engagement. You want to know how frequently they're actually engaging with your core action, whatever it is, whether it's purchases, whether it's rides, whether it's um, playing a level in a game. And then you want to answer the hows and the whys, right? How are they engaging with my product? Why are they doing it? Are they taking a ride every day um, you know, to go to work and come back? Are they just using it as a designated driver? Are they buying expensive items? Are they buying low, like, low value items? How and why are they actually using my product? Uh, and then you want to marry the who on top of that, right? So who are these people, right? Um, you know, and again, Facebook Audience Insights allows you to do that really quickly. Uh, and then lastly, you want to optimize ad spend for power users to so maximize uh, the ROI with limited budget, right? Um, so you want to leverage your ad spend um, to target these people, right? And uh, only those people if you can identify those power users. Uh, and I mean, to close out, all of the above will help you grow a lot faster. Um, and uh, before, I, before I let you go and open this up to questions, um, I just want to call out these tools again that I, I recommend. So Mixed Panel, Web Analytics, Amplitude's Rate for Mobile In-App Analytics, uh, Facebook Audience Insights, um, again, that'll give you demographic data. Autopilot's awesome for CRM optimization. Uh, Segment IO and Particle, these are kind of like the, uh, the one, they're like these data hubs. Uh, I like to call them the one API integration to rule all API integrations. So if you plug in a segment or end particle, you can basically plug in there to anybody else uh, really quickly and easily. Uh, that's it, guys. That's all I have. Um, hopefully you got the idea that power users do matter, that they're worth a lot more, that uh, you can actually get paid back on your investment a lot faster using power users uh, or, or identifying power users and uh, trying to bring them into your funnel. Um, I'll open up the questions now. Um, went over some of that really fast, got a little nervous for whatever reason, but I'll open it up. Um, so if anybody has any questions, let me know. Um, also, I'll also go to slide you to see if there's anything in there. No questions yet. Okay. Any questions uh, in general? One question. Maybe a strange question, but I'm just thinking about <clears throat> have you found in your experience any limitation to power users? So I'm just thinking about the case of, of Twitter, where um, because it's a, a great product for some folks, you have, you can overinvest and a lot of folks continue to use the product, but then you start to see that some folks aren't using the product, which essentially kind of contributes to a lack of growth over time. So just have you, have you seen any or any learnings around um, any caps or limitations to, um, to finding power users and trying to invest? Well, there's only so many of them, right? So I think like in the case of Twitter, they're flatlining on their growth right now. Right? Um, and I imagine they've got all the power users they're going to get in most of the regions they're in. So now like, there are strategies to expand globally to try to find new power users in different pockets, but they're pretty much saturated in the US. So yeah, you will saturate them over time. Um, and then you can always try to hunt for them for new, via new channels. But most likely, in Twitter's case, they're so old, they probably already got all the power users they're going to get. <coughs> so yes, I mean, you see saturation. OK, cool. Anything else? Yeah. Um, you didn't mention so much about uh, direct consumer surveys to try and get back some information uh, outside of, say, Facebook. We've certainly found that not everybody is on Facebook necessarily. The data may not be entirely accurate. Um, and so the question is really, if, can you find other information from direct surveys that would help? I was going to call out surveys. Um, I recommended some companies use surveys, uh, especially with like within power segments that you identify. Um, but audience insights is just such an easier tool to use um, that, and they give you more data. And most people don't like responding to surveys too. The engagement's usually low, 
So you usually have to incentivize those surveys. Are you sending out like incentivized or non-incentivized surveys? Uh, usually non-incentivized to our users, our customers, trying to understand their feedback maybe on other kinds, not just the basics of age and, and gender and income, but maybe other, the websites they may visit, uh, television shows or magazines they are reading, uh, things of that sort that can help inform the picture of the segment. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so to get data that Facebook wouldn't have, and if you want to get like data specific to your business, I think it totally makes sense. Surveying um, is definitely relevant for that. I was kind of painting a pretty broad brush and a pretty broad stroke of like just general demographic data and where you can get that. Um, so it's kind of like demographic data 101, right? Like age, gender, location, right? That's pretty much applicable to everybody. But if you want to know like specific product use case stuff, um, I think surveying definitely works. Okay, cool. Other stuff. Anything else? I went over that pretty fast. Um, so I, I apologize for that. But uh, anything else around um, power uses or whatnot? Um, I do not see any other questions. Um, so I will let it go at that. Um, guys, I am, uh, my email is danielfeverinstartup.com. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you, one more. We Cohort analysis. What about it? Cohort analysis. Well, I'm beginning to learn about it, but like um, you have a cohort and you want to see a change of made, is influencing more engagement or something like that. And when you say power users, um, are they? How does that relate to cohorts? I'm just trying to. Is it is it really a segment of cohorts or a particular you know, type of cohort? It is. It is. Yeah. So power users is a type of cohort. So like if you look at cohort definitions, you can divide, the cohort could be anything. It could be users divided by time, it could be users divided by age, gender, um, location of their end, right? A cohort is just a group of users. The distinction in terms of how you want to define those group of users and how you want to divide those group of users is up to you. Most, co most people uh, use cohort analysis anonymously with time, right? So uh, it could be a group of users that you acquired in like January of this year, right? Um, and then we look at their behavior over time to kind of try to identify what they're doing and whether they're power users or they're not. Um, is that the question in terms of like how do you look at culverts in general? Or I just want a little more guidance in terms of what you want to actually know. Because like culverts are really broad. If you had a cohort, then how are you just to take that cohort? Would be using from another cohort, right? So yeah, I mean, so. If you identify a segment of power users, would they be distinct from like your your other users, right? Um, yeah, most likely they would be. So let's say if you have a broad cohort of users that you acquired in January, um, like everybody that you acquired in January. So maybe, I don't know, say you're doing 100 signups a day, 3,000 signups, right? And 10% of them are power users, right? They were spending um, a lot of money. So maybe they were spending like $1,000 a day, right? You were generating $300,000 from those people. Um, you could look at those people as like high value payers and just segment out those users and look at their activity as a separate cohort compared to everybody else. Okay, cool. So that looks like um, that looks like it's it. I think from the floor, I don't I don't uh, see any other questions. Um, but again, um, if you guys want to talk about LTV calculations, unit economics, um, power users, non-power users. Uh, you can reach out to me at Daniel 500 Startups. Um, I'm here <coughs> basically one day a week, um, so you can reach out to me anytime. Um, thanks, guys.